Amen. Here in Galatians chapter 2, I want to share this thought this morning. If you'll look at verse number 19 with me, Galatians chapter number 2. And in verse number 19, he says, For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. And here's the thought for today, is that we're dead and we ought to live for Christ. In fact, he says it in another way in the next verse. Look at verse 20. For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to break down this verse this morning. This is the key text for the sermon this morning. I want to share with you the importance of understanding that according to God's law, we are all found dead. We're convicted guilty. We deserve eternal hell. Second death. Uh, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. If we got what we deserve, we would go to hell. But God is not willing that any should perish. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All we have to do is call upon the name of the Lord, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're saved forever. It's a one-time thing. He wants us to receive this, and when you do, He also then wants us to understand now He has a great purpose for your life. I truly believe that every human being, God has a will for you. He has a desire for you. He has a place for you. He has a ministry for you. There are things that you can do for God now that you're saved for the rest of your days, whether they be few or whether they be many. God distinctly has a purpose and a mission for you. I do not believe that God just kind of, well, that person doesn't really matter much, or I didn't have any plan for them. No, I really believe that every one of you, God has a special purpose and a special plan for you. The problem is, most of us live for this world. We live for the desires of the flesh. We live to please ourselves. We live to just be entertained. If you haven't noticed, America's in deep trouble right now. It's because everybody's checked out and they're entertained by the television and they've given up on God. They're not reading the Word of God. They're not praying to God. And they just want to be lied to by the TV and they are entranced with the lies and they have no clue what the truth is anymore. America needs to get back to the truth of the Word of God and searching for God and pleasing the Lord. He tells us here in this verse, he says, I am crucified with Christ. We ought to be dead to this world. He says, nevertheless, I live. He says, and yet I am alive forevermore. I have eternal life through Jesus Christ. He says, yet not I. He says, it's not me that's still alive. He says, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. People will throw around the phrase, I have Jesus in my heart. We don't really see that in the Bible, but that's kind of what he's talking about, is you've opened the door of your heart, and you've asked for God to come and to dwell with you, and that's his will for you. Now, if he's inside and you give him the steering wheel, then he's going to start driving you in his direction instead of letting the devil take you captive at his will and ruin your life. He says, and the life which I now live in the flesh. That's what we're still here. Listen, here's the thing. We're saved. We get a new man. But you still have that old man present with you. The old fleshly ways are there. The old habits are there. The old thoughts are there. That old music is still in there. Those old music, that the, the, the TV shows and the movies from years ago, it's still in here and it affects our personality. We say things that we picked up from a movie 10 years ago, and we say it today like it's part of us. Christ says, no, 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 I want to give you a reset. I want to dwell in you, and I want to drive you. He says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. We need to live by faith. We need to walk by faith. We need to pray in faith. We need to believe that God can do great things in our life. And too many Christians have just believed the lie that I'm unimportant. I evolved from some ape. 
and we're just some blue dot in millions and millions of stars. That's not true. It's all about the earth. It's all about the souls. There's a great harvest coming one day, and God's going to show up, and He's going to redeem the precious fruit of the earth, and He's after your soul. And you're going to stand before Him and answer for what you did with your time. So why don't we spend our time now? He says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of of the Son of God. Why don't you live like you belong to the Son of God? He says, who loved me and gave Himself for me. You understand, His love for us was that He died for our sins. And now He rose again. And now God wants to dwell in your heart by faith in Him. And He gave us the pattern of how we ought to be. He gave us the perfect example. You say, what kind of a life should I have? Well, uh, Jesus was called the King of Kings, was He not? And the Lord of Lords. And Jesus was that great high priest, and He tells us three times in the book of Revelation that we're going to be kings and we're going to be priests. You know what that means? Well, let's take a step back, because in our fleshly mind, this life that I live in the flesh now, if somebody came to you and said, we just found out you have royal blood. We want you to be the ruler of a nation and you have unlimited resources. We're going to give you everything you've ever wanted. In the flesh, we love that, right? Yeah. But now when God entered into His creation and He came as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and He owned it all, do you know what it says? He came in the form of a servant. He washed the feet of the one that would betray Him the night that he, they put Him to death. He came serving people. He had compassion on people. As a king, he used his power to serve through humility and through love. As our great high priest, he taught salvation to everyone. He taught it to the average people. He didn't go to the great spiritual leaders. Well, he did. He rebuked them. But he took the gift of salvation and he taught biblical understanding to average people. And then they brought children to him and he said, Suffer them. He said, don't refuse children. Bring them into the church. I mean, that's an important concept because today most churches don't want children in the church. And I thank God for every child that's in here that listens to the Word of God and learns to sing to God. This is an important part of your life. Uh, when you run into an older couple that... I, I was just talking to one this week and they're in a more liberal church and the music's a little more liberal than they like. It's a little more rock and roll, but it's well-meaning. And now they're going to drop the name Baptist off their church. And I start talking to them and I have no doubt that they're saved. They believe the Bible. Uh, where did you get this good doctrine? Oh, that's right. They were raised in a Baptist church as a child and taught to fear the Lord and read the Bible for themselves. But that's not where they're at today. In fact, their church is so far from what they were raised in, they yearn for an old-style church where we just get back to the basics, the old paths of what God gave us. The title of my sermon this morning is Live Before You Die. The thought behind it is we should live for Christ before death takes you. Before death takes your body, you need to live for Christ He's given you power over this world. My first point is that we are not saved by our works. It's not by changing our habits or our lifestyle. It's by changing what we believe. Changing who we trust in to get to heaven. You're in Galatians chapter 2. First find verse number 16. Look at it. In Galatians 2 verse 16 he says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You know what he's saying? I mean, anybody that's ever gotten pulled over and gotten a speeding ticket, you're busted, you broke the law. And you can't tell that cop, that officer, you can't tell that trooper, you cannot say, yeah, but normally I don't speed. He's going to say, well, today you did and today I got you. And every time you do speed and you get away with it, you just know that you're breaking the law. You're breaking the law. And if, I mean, imagine if somebody came into church today and they say, Pastor, I didn't go one mile over the whole time getting here. I didn't sin. And I'll say, well, good for you, but tell me about yesterday. Tell me about the day before, because I know you were pedaled to the metal, right? Uh, what, gun it and run it, right? I, I know how it goes. And it's like, what, what I'm saying is we can't just say, I'm good. I've earned salvation because... You have it. We've sinned. We've broken the law. We need the righteousness of Christ 
by faith in Him. Look at the last verse in this chapter. Look at verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He says, if you can work your way to heaven, then why did Jesus even die? And I ask that, I ask people all the time, How, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? I think so, maybe. Some will say, oh, I know so. And I say, what do you have to do to go to heaven? I had one yesterday. Well, let's see, I, I keep the commandments and I uh, try to go to church. And I'm good to people and I try to love everybody and they're saying all this stuff. I say, can you even name the commandments? Uh, well, if you can't name them, how are you keeping them? They're trusting in their own works. We can't trust ourselves. If I could be good enough to go to heaven, we don't need Jesus. We do need Jesus. And then he says, hey, you're saved by me. Let me live in you and lead you and guide you and point you in the right direction. In fact, his will for your life, God has a special purpose for you. And when you find it and you do it and you live for Christ, there is a special blessing in your life that you know it only comes from God. There is joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's something about it that is just beyond explanation. You can't just tell somebody about it because they would say, oh, I don't know, that's coincidental. They don't understand it because God's not dwelling in them. If you're lost, you have to understand. Focus on the faith of God, not your own works. You can never say, I've been good enough. Ephesians 2.8, he says, we're saved through faith. That's what you believe. Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not to be earned or worked for, it's a totally free gift. My second point is that we should be dead to sin. Now, uh, a dead man doesn't really get too excited, does he? If we had a, a, a cadaver, if we had a corpse up here, if we were somebody laying in a coffin, and we played their favorite song, would they get up and dance? If we cooked their favorite food, their best meal, would they, oh, oh wow, I'm ready for that, would they? No. But we in the flesh right now, we get excited by the senses. And unfortunately, it often leads us to sin. God wants us to be dead to the sin of this world and live for Christ. He, and he gives us the power to do it. Notice what he says there. Look at it again in, in Galatians 2, verse 20. This is the key verse. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not Christ in me. He says, I'm crucified with with Christ. Go to Romans chapter 6. I want you to see this. I want you to understand what he's talking about. Go to Romans chapter number 6. I am crucified with Christ. He's saying you should be dead to sin. You should be able by the power of the Holy Spirit to not be tempted to sin or not be tempted to go down the wrong path. He gives you power. And look, I know we're all weak in the flesh. That's the old man. But now he's given us of the new man to give us power over this world. We have to walk in this flesh, but we don't have to live in the flesh. We ought to live in faith and walk in faith. You're in Romans chapter 6. If you would, look at verse number 1. Verse number 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So you're saved. It was a free gift. Okay, so what should we do? Should we just go back to living the way we were? What's he say in verse 2? God forbid. He's saying, no way. <laughs> no way, Jose. He says, don't do it. Whatever you do, don't go and live like a lost man or like the lost world because God has a special blessing if you'll go after it. He says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You know, if you go back to that bondage, it's like, it's like putting yourself back in the chains. Can you imagine a released prisoner and the whole time they're in prison, the whole time they're in jail and they're in chains, they say, get me out of here. I want out. I'll do anything to get out of here. And they get out and all of a sudden they're like, oh, I don't know, all my buddies are in there. I'm kind of used to life in there. I knew how to thrive when I was in a cell. This is hard work out here. Can you guys lock me back up? Know ye not. Look at verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us were, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, 
that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You say, Pastor Fanner, why, why do people get in the baptismal? and why, why do they go under the water? What is that a picture of? And here's what it is. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that His death and burial, and He resurrected, and He's alive right now, that He paid for all of your sins, you are baptized spiritually into the family of God, and you get baptized and immersed with that Holy Spirit, and now it's like, now I have power to be dead to sin, and when I go up there and I get in the water, and I go down, it's like saying, I was dead, I was spiritually dead, but now I'm alive forevermore, and I should walk in newness of life. Baptism comes after you're saved. It's a representation of just simply saying, I was spiritually dead, and now I'm alive forever. I have everlasting life. Look at verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall, also, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. He's talking about eternal life. Listen, if you're saved, you have eternal life now. No one can take it from you. And when this body drops, you will continue to live in life and blessing with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. You don't go to hell. You skip hell. You go straight to heaven. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So there it is. When you're saved, this flesh is very powerful, but when you're saved, God gives you the spirit that makes a new man that actually has more power than this flesh. He wants us to understand that we should not serve sin. He wants us to understand that we should walk in the newness of life. He wants us to understand that we now have the power through the Spirit to be dead to sin. You say, Pastor Fan, I used to have this sin, and man, I did it for 20 years, and it was a besetting sin, and whenever I see my friends doing it, I just I, I, I struggle. I want to be there with them. And it's like, yeah, but you have the Holy Spirit now. You should have new friends. You should have a new direction. You have a new spirit. You have a new life. And here's, here's what it's all about. You have a new purpose. You understand that God, who sees everything, He made everybody, and He sees your decisions in advance. He knows whether you'll believe on Him and be saved. He has a perfect plan for you to minister to others. He can use you. He can use you. You don't have to be a preacher to be used of God. In fact, rarely does God work through the preacher. There's only one preacher. And I don't know, there's what, 60, 70 folks here this morning. And you, you guys have the power to do more than I could ever do. I want you to think about that. If every one of you went out of here this week and said, I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus and I'm going to tell them that there's power in His name and there's forgiveness of sins and I'm going to invite them to come to church and hear the truth and get close to Him and I'm going to encourage them to read the Bible. You are doing the job of a preacher. You are part of the ministry. You're pointing people to Christ. The problem is we're often ashamed of our testimony because we're walking in that old fleshly man instead of the new spiritual man. Look at verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. The problem is some people don't really want to be free. They rather suffer in their sin than to have true joy and redemption. Look at verse 12 in this. Here's the goal. Romans 6, verse 12, here's our goal. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. He says, don't obey sin. You have two choices. You can obey God, or you obey sin. If you obey sin, you're going back into bondage. You're saying, lock me up. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. My first point was that we're saved by faith, not works. My second is now that we should be dead to sin. Here's my third point, is that God lives in you forever. God indwells you forever. If you remember in Galatians 2.20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ lives in you. Christ lives in you. Some of you would say, I lost a spouse, or I 
I lost a brother or a sister, or even we have folks that have lost sons this week, this past week. But they live in your memory. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ says, you're saved, the death, burial, and resurrection. Now let Christ live in you, not just in a memory, but let it live in your life. Let's demonstrate Christ and His power in our everyday life. Ephesians chapter 3, find verse number 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. What a statement. Do you understand what he just said? That ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. He says, I want you to have God dwelling in you. I want you to operate on God's agenda. I want you to see the vision that God has for your life. And here's the thing. Most of us just simply don't have enough faith to submit our body and our desire. Well, yeah, but if I give him everything, then I'm going to lose some stuff. <laughs> it's usually how it works. Are you all in for the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you want all the fullness of God inside of you? Because God wants to work in you, in every part of you. Look what he says in verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Do you understand what that says? God can do much greater things, yea, more than we could ever even think of asking. We say, God, I, I, I just wish you'd bless me in this area of my life. And we only know to ask for so much. And he says, yeah, but I've got so much more that you don't even know to ask for. Look what he says in verse 20. He is able to do exceedingly, that's going past, abundantly, that's overflowing, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. When God moves in, and then we say, okay, God, I need your blessing. I want to work for you. Can you use me to see one person saved? Our brother Jake gave the example last month in Sunday school. He was doing the preaching, and he said, I set a goal for whatever year it was, I want to see one person saved this year. I've been in church my whole life. I've heard the gospel. I realized I wasn't saved because I was trusting in my own works. I got saved and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That was real easy for me to get saved. I just want to learn the verses so I can share this with somebody else and spiritually reproduce myself. I'm setting a goal. I want to see one saved. And then God gave him abundantly, exceedingly abundantly more than he asked. How many people did you get saved that year? Over 100 in 2018. 2015, he set the goal for one. He got one. And then it was like, okay, I'm done for the year. Let's do that again. Let's go knock on another door. Let's preach the gospel again. Let's find somebody else. And you may be sitting there saying, yeah, but you just don't know. I, I've been in church and I know the gospel. I'm just, I'm not good with words. I think Moses said that, didn't he? Wasn't it Moses? Don't we have five books named after him? <laughs> I'm not good with words. You've got to help me, Lord. He says, oh, and I will. I'll help your tongue. You see, I'm not that good with people. Don't worry about that. I have personally found that those that go out and evangelize, it's the ones that are awkward person to person. Like We can't hardly hold a conversation about anything, but you get out to the door, and you're filled with all the fullness of God, and the Holy Spirit takes over, and you're like, I know I'm ashamed, and I'm embarrassed, and I'm weak as a human, but I don't care. I'm going to submit all of myself to God, and I'm going to let God use me and speak through me, because right now this person is lost, and if they'll just hear it, then they can believe it. And they don't have to spend eternity in hell. What a beautiful goal. I want you to understand, God indwells you forever. He says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You say, I'm saved. Why doesn't God just rapture me out of here right now? Yeah. He's not done saving souls. And he needs your help. You have the power. But the problem is we don't have that kind of faith to ask. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Look at verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. 
He says, it's in the church, I'm going to get the glory, and I'm going to get the power, and we're going to help each other, we're going to motivate each other, we're going to learn, and we're going to go out and help this world. This is supposed to be a light on a hill. We're supposed to be a lighthouse, if you will, a hospital. We're here to teach people, we're here to help people. And it's not about one man. Well, it is, it's about the man, Christ Jesus, that died for you, and he's resurrected. It's all about God. If you would go to 2 Corinthians 5, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to understand that Christ liveth in you. His goal is that you would be filled with all the fullness of God and see His vision for you. Uh, Jesus said that He would not leave us comfortless. He said that I will give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth Him not. He says, He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. If you have the kind of faith to understand that the fullness of God has been granted to you as a gift for the purpose of preaching the gospel and the purpose of cleaning up your life, there are many reasons that we're given the Holy Spirit. There are many reasons. I mean, I could list 20, but I'm giving you two. One is to clean up your life so you can be dead to sin. And the other is to preach Christ to others. Point number four. We have a duty to be Christ-like. Now remember, he's both king and priest. He has all authority, and he was a teacher. Remember he says, the life in Galatians 2.20, he says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I say, what are you living for? Well, you know, I, I'm about to get that raise. If I can just put in a little bit more, if I can just pour all of myself into that job, I can get a little more money back from my slave owner, right? my master. You say, what do you live for? Oh, I just got this hobby. I've got a video game, and if I can just bum wrestle that piece of plastic enough, it'll, it'll ding at me and show me, woo, 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 I got something. What are you living for? Go Jags. Shouldn't Jesus be over the Jags? Oh, yeah. Whatever your hobbies are, whatever your fancy is, whatever your skills, don't let any of those things get in the way of living for the Lord Jesus Christ. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He is asking you to take a walk of faith, a step of faith, a leap of faith, and just give it to Him, and give it all to Him, and don't look back. Don't live for the world and the lust thereof. Live for the Lord Jesus Christ, and He will take care of you, He will protect you, He will provide for you, He will bless you in every way. God is so good. But we're weak in faith. You're in 2 Corinthians 5, is that right? Yes. Please find verse number 7. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Do you know that there are some people that didn't come to church this morning because they saw on the news last night that World War III might be kicking off in Israel? Did you know that? They're glued to the TV right now, and they're all worked up. Oh, no, Israel and Palestine, they're going at it. This is the big sign, and, and it is. There's something in the Bible. And you know what? Oh, it could happen anymore. I, I just got to stay glued to this thing and see if we're going to go to war. And I got to be scared of everything, and I'm just going to sit here and bite my nails, and I can't go to church and worship God this morning. I'm too worried about the rest of the world. He says we walk by faith, not by sight. Don't let what you see in the world distract you and deceive you from serving the Lord. Look, he says in verse 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He says, I want to get out of here any moment. As soon as I die, I'm with him. I look forward to that. However, verse 9, wherefore, he says, for that reason, we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Be accepted. Now, the student does a piece of paper and he turns it into the teacher. And mom goes, no, 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 this is not acceptable. You didn't even spell your name right. Do it again, right? 
Now, think about being accepted. What's he talking about? Whether we're here or whether we're there, he says whether we're present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. We might please Him. We would be approved of Him. That what we say and do would be worship toward Him and service toward Him and not toward everybody else in this world. Verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, Elsewhere, he says, he's coming back and he's going to get the precious fruit of the earth. He's talking about your soul. He's coming back for your soul. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. When's the last time you tried to persuade someone that a judgment is coming? There's a harvest of souls coming, and God is coming back, and we're going to have to answer for what we did while we walked in this flesh on this world. When's the last time you went out of your way to persuade someone? It tells us elsewhere that we should compel them. They were compelling them. They're encouraging them. They're exhorting them. They're motivating them. They're convincing them. These are action words. I believe we need to be aggressive as Christians and we need to preach the gospel. We live in a time when it's not popular. We live in a time when children were raised up and they don't know the heroes of the faith. They don't know who Moses and Jonah and David and Elijah, they don't know these great men of God and what they've done. They're weak. Well, let's teach them as Jesus did as a priest. Let's lead them as if we were a king now. Let's not wait for the resurrection. There's a great harvest of souls coming. He says in verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's your duty. If you would, go to Genesis chapter 18. Go to Genesis chapter 18. We have a duty to be like Christ, both king and priest. He tells us that, he said, we have not been given the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When the rest of the world is scared to death, we don't have to be because we've been given the spirit of power. We've been given the spirit of love. We've been given a spirit of a sound mind. When a disaster strikes, people get hysterical. When somebody gets in a wreck, sometimes they hyperventilate and they're overwhelmed. But let me tell you something. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And no matter what's happening around you, you have the power to control this vessel, your body, and glorify God in every situation. You have the power of a clear and a sound mind, of a sober mind when the rest of the world is confused and scared to death. You have power over the grave given to you by the Holy Spirit. What do you have to be afraid of? What are you going to do? Threaten me with death? What are you going to do? Threaten me with eternity with the Lord? We have nothing to fear. He's called us according to His own purpose. That's why He says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, listen, God has a great purpose for you. He has a very specific and detailed plan, and you're part of it. Your part in the plan, it's as if we were making a 10,000-piece puzzle, and you're sitting over there like a bump on a log saying, I'm just not interested in going along with God's plan. I'll do it my way when I'm ready. And we're over here like, we need this puzzle piece. If only we had it, it would help the big picture and everyone else around. God has a plan for you. You're part of the body of Christ. You're part of the big picture. And you don't have to be a heavy lifter. You don't have to be artillery to be in the Lord's army. There are munitions and there are cooks and there's all sorts of stuff. We work together for Him. The problem is we usually lack faith to take these steps. My last point is this, and it's very simple. We are to become a living sacrifice. 
You think of Abraham, how didn't understand everything, but he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness, it said in Genesis 15. And he brought his son as a picture of the gospel. It tells us in the New Testament that the gospel was preached before unto Abraham, that he understood the picture of the Son of God. And then God comes to him and says, okay, you finally have that son that you wanted so bad. He says, go ahead and sacrifice your son. Oh, uh, my, my, my boy? In Hebrews, it says that he believed God could raise him up. Well, I believe in everlasting life, and I believe God's going to raise me up one day. And if God wants to do a miracle, and he has for other men, uh, he's done it in the Old Testament, he's done it in the New Testament, Lazarus and others, where they were raised up. Paul was raised up after being dead. Well, that could happen today. I do believe that. Now, God doesn't work in miraculous signs like he did, but he can. His hand is not shortened. If, if, if God wanted to kill me and bring me back to the life, he could do it for his glory. He could do it today. Well, Abraham had that kind of faith. He said, Says, okay, Lord, I, I see what you're getting. I've, I've put it all in on this son. I'm so focused on this blessing of a son. You want me to kill him as a picture of you giving the sacrificial lamb of your son, and you're going to raise him up because I already believe the gospel. I believe, and you're just teaching me more. And Abraham took his son up the hill, and he put him on the altar, and then God stopped him, and there was a ram caught in the thicket, a ram as a young male, and that's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would John the Baptist say, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He was our substitute. Somebody had to pay. You got a light bill this month. Somebody has to pay it. I can write you a check or you can do it yourself. And it comes, when it comes to our sin, the Lord Jesus Christ has already written the check and he's holding it out. He's saying, here, take the gift. And we're saying, no, 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 I think I'll do it my own way. I want you to understand that we become a living sacrifice. In Galatians 2.20, he ends that verse by saying, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the picture of how we live is that we give of ourselves to serve others. We ought to focus on getting close to Christ and educating ourselves of the Bible so that we can give that to somebody else so that they can increase their faith. We give ourselves to the ministry. We give ourselves to serving our brothers and sisters in Christ. We even serve the lost world for God's glory. He says in, in Mark, he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Anytime you do something kind or compassionate, it ought to be when they say, thank you, you say, don't thank me, thank Christ. Because if it wasn't for Christ living in me, I'd be a rotten old scoundrel and I'd be selfish and I wouldn't be helping anybody. I thank God He's given me a new heart. And I thank Him He's given me eternal life. And I just want to tell you that somebody loves you and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to give Him the glory for all that we do. You're in Genesis 18. I, I want to give you this vision, right? Here's the thought. If we're to live before we die, if we're to live for Christ before death takes you out of this body, and we're going to live like a king and a priest when we get there, then we ought to live like it now, with all authority when it comes to serving others and teaching the Scriptures. Abraham had this vision. You're in... You're in Genesis 18. Genesis 18. Please find verse number 19. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. He says, I know this guy. We've got to tell him what's going on. He's part of the plan. He's going to take the reins. Or here's a New Testament phrase. Take the oversight thereof. He says... He will command what's right. He says, dads, pay attention especially, but this applies to every individual. I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. Guys, listen, if your children grow up honoring the Lord, it's not an accident, it's intentional. 
If you're, if you're a manager or a boss, you are to command people and instruct them. They're supposed to follow you. He's talking about dad standing up, being a man of God, and leading by example, growing spiritually every day so that he can get closer to Christ instead of turning around and saying, well, you aren't following me right and you're not living right. You look at yourself and you get yourself moving in the right direction and trust the Lord that they will just follow you. He says, they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. I really believe that everyone in here, under the sound of my voice, God's will is that you would believe on him and then live for him while you're alive. And if you'll do that, then God will bring this blessing upon you that he's already promised. We just, we just can't see it because we have a lack of faith. These commands, go to Luke 21, and we'll stop there. Go to Luke chapter 21. One more verse, guys. Luke 21. These commands aren't just for fathers. They're for individuals. They're for everyone. Ephesians 5, he says, Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That means being the best servant you can because you serve the Lord Christ. He says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That means, Dad, lay your life down and, and die to your selfishness. Ephesians 6, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That applies to you, children. You need to obey your parents because God said so, and you need to do it like you're obeying God. You need to do it as you honor the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. <laughs> what a promise. If you teach your children, obey me, not because... I want all the glory, but obey me because this is a pattern of God. Now watch Daddy as Daddy obeys God and you obey Daddy and Mommy obeys Daddy. Well, it's because we believe in God. God has a perfect plan for the family. Galatians 2.20. You're in Luke 21. Stay there. And, and I've got one last verse for you, but let me read this one more time. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You need to live before you die. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. You're in Luke chapter 21. If you would, look at verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life and so that day come upon you unawares. You say, what is surfeiting and drunkenness? Surfeiting is uh, an overabundance of pleasure, overdoing it. We've got a chili cook-off coming up, and uh, there's probably going to be a few guys in here guilty of just overloading their bowl full of chili, right? Sometimes we're, we're enjoying this life so much that we're just soaking up as much as we can get while we're here. And we forget that we walk in this life in the flesh. We walk in faith of Christ. We're supposed to live for Christ before we die. We're not supposed to live it up and check off our bucket list. We're supposed to have faith that God has a promise for us, that He has a purpose for us, that there's a blessing for believing, and then there's a blessing for obeying. It's our job to obey. He says, look at it, he says, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. Guys, and that's it. That's the message. Don't let the cares of this life overcharge you. Don't be so focused on what you can get and feel and do and accomplish here that you fail to see your purpose in Christ. He does have a plan for you. You are part of the big picture. It's time for us to see that plan and get on board. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help these scriptures to resonate. Lord, I pray that you would help the, your word to lead us and guide us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, we're, we're to be crucified with you and to live for you. I pray that you would help us to see that vision, Lord, 
and spend the rest of our days honoring you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.